we're very thankful for this day and the loving kindness. Thank thee, Father, for allowing us to be together this evening to study thy word. We pray that all things we do and say will be in accordance with thy will. Thee, we, Father, will take what we learned this evening and use it in our lives to draw closer to thee. We ask thee to be with those that are sick, especially those of thy children. May they have better health and strength in days to come, and may we always help them in some way. Forgive us of our sins as we forgive others of their sins against us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Last week we started some lessons on attitude. You know, a lot of times in life we, we all have attitudes about different things. And most of the time if we have an attitude about something that's going on, we like to put our two cents worth in. And sometimes we wonder, is it worth two cents? But the thought in mind to understand is that there were those in Bible times that had different attitudes about the Word of God. Different attitudes about how to serve God and how to worship. And the idea in mind to understand is that today, as you and I strive to serve God, our attitude means a lot as to what you and I think about our time in worship. We are here to offer our devotions unto God. We are here to praise Him. And we are here to uplift each other. Let's always strive with whatever attitude we have in our lives to always encourage those that are striving to go to heaven and those that need the gospel. Because there are many in our world today that need the gospel bad. They don't know it. They've, not, they've never been taught it. And it's up to us to teach those around us that we can, those who are lost in sin, and who will probably lose their soul if they don't change their lives. So we must be encouraged today as you and I think about our attitude, and we think about those in Bible times. First scripture I'll look at tonight is Exodus chapter 32, and I'll begin reading in verse 1. Exodus chapter 32, beginning in verse 1. The scripture gives us an idea here about, about the people back then, back then in that day and time. <clears throat> the attitude they had of how God, they had begged for God for years to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Please get us out of bondage. And the thought was in man that God raised up a deliverer to lead them out of the land of bondage. Do you know who that deliverer was? Somebody tell me. Moses. Who was the brother of Moses? And who was his sister? Who was his mother and father? Amram and Jacobed. And the thought of man to understand is that he came from a family that took care of him and raised him well. We all know that Moses was raised up in the court of Pharaoh. And the thought was in man that when it came time for God's plan to be fulfilled, Moses left the land of Egypt because he did something that he didn't like. He killed an Egyptian and buried him in the sand. One lesson that I want you to gather from that is that we can go through this life and we can do a lot of things, but you can't hide when you commit sin. Somebody is going to know, and most certainly God is going to know. So I want us to look at the occasion now as the children of Israel have left the land of Egypt Estimated about 2 million people that left the land of Egypt are the children of Israel. And Moses had the task of leading these people. Can you imagine a task of leading 2 million people out of a land that is a hateful land, leading 2 million people out across the desert and toward the promised land? What a task that had to have been. <clears throat> what a job. Because you've got people that want to work with you. You've got people that don't like you. You've got people that work against you. You've got all of those that are combined in this large group of people that have their own ideas about things. Is it any different today? No, it's not any different. We have people of all kinds and all natures in this world. And there are those in this world that are here to help you. There are those here that don't like you. And there are those here that work against you. And so we kind of see where Moses was. Exodus chapter 32, beginning in verse 1. Moses had, went up, <clears throat> Moses had went up onto the mountain, we might look at, to 
What did he go up on Mount Sinai for? Received the Ten Commandments. And these Ten Commandments were written on what? Tables of stone. I just said, now here it was in the occasion of the beginning in verse 1 of chapter 32 of Exodus. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mountain, the people gathered themselves together under Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we walk not what has become of him. Okay, so I want you to notice and understand this. They didn't know where Moses was. They didn't have enough confidence in the fact that Moses would come back. And their minds got to wondering about what are we going to do? Now let's understand this, that there are those today in our world that think the Lord has delayed his coming. And we don't know whether he's coming back or not. So we're not going to get ready. We're not going to prepare. Same kind of attitude, same kind of idea today. And thereby they look for other things to worship. Look for other ways to do other than what the Bible says. Brothers and sisters, that's dangerous. Because if you mess with the plan of God, you mess with your salvation. You don't want to do that. Then beginning in verse 2. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron, and received them at their hand, and fashioned it with a graving tool, after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast of the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. You see, friends, this here was everything else but a religious organization. Everything else but a religious practice. Because whenever they started to rise up to play and they started to carouse, and they started to commit sin. We turn and look over in the New Testament, and the Bible says they rose up to play, and they committed fornication, and 23,000 fell in one day. Understand, friends, that these people here had decided for themselves. We're going to make us something to lead us. All right, you and I know and understand that we must have faith in God. What does it take to have faith in God? Have any of you ever seen God? No, but we've seen what he can do. We've seen what he has done and what can be accomplished. If I have to have something to see that I worship, my religion is no longer what God intended for it to be. It's got to be on the basis of faith. Faith, friends, is what pleases our Heavenly Father and what our Lord wants. So do I have faith in God to help me through the trials of life do I have faith in God to obey the will that God gave? Do I have the faith to always fulfill whatever God asked me to do? These people here lost their faith. They lost their trust. They lost their trust in Moses. They lost their trust in leadership. But they also lost their trust in God. When you lose your trust in God, you lose it all. Friends, we don't want to do that. You might remember a little later on whenever Aaron was talked to about this situation. He said, I put all of this in that fire and out came a golden calf. Now, isn't that strange? It didn't just come out. They fashioned, they fashioned this golden calf. And I want to ask you something. Why did they choose a calf? Why was, that, why was it so important to have a, a golden calf? Where did they get this idea at? The what? All right. But this is what they did down in Egypt. In Egypt, they worshipped calves. They worshipped the sun. They worshipped everything that you can imagine. So thereby, when the children of Israel left the land of Egypt, they still had in their mind what they had seen for these 400 years, they had in their mind what, how they'd seen the people do. And so thereby they thought, we'll do just like they did. 
William McDush or Golden Cave? I know. You know, I don't understand. I don't understand where their reasoning was. But do you ever notice that sometimes when people get kind of fickle in their mind and they get these strange ideas, they'll do the strangest things. And that's what these people did right here. They did something very strange. They built a golden calf to worship. Do we have people today that worship golden calves? Do we have people today that worship idols? Most certainly do. And can you tell me what an idol is? Does an idol have to be made of wood or stone? What is an idol? Anything we put before God. Anything we put between us and Him. And friends, that ranges in a wide category of things that people do in their lives to push God out. We don't want to do that. Because if you push God out, you're throwing away your salvation. And we don't want to do that. Also, the idea in mind of the people not only bow down to this cave, but also a little later on, we're going to notice that they're going to bow down to Baal. Anybody know what Baal is? Baal was a false god. A God that people chose to worship, a God that people chose to bow down to. And we're going to read about that over in Numbers chapter 25. And we'll be going to read it in verse 1 in just a minute. But you see, people, friends, understand what you got to know. A person has to have something to worship. We have to have something, something to hold in reverence in our lives. And if you don't hold the God of the heavens in reverence in your lives, Something else will take its place. And you'll worship, you'll worship anything. You'll bow down to anything. You see, friends, the whole idea in mind is this to understand. God wants to be first in our lives, doesn't he? In order for God to be first, he must first of all have my worship. He must first of all have my life. He must first of all, in the dedication that I have in my days of living, he must have my time. Do I give God enough time? Do I give him the honor he deserves? But in Numbers chapter 25, beginning in verse 1, And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to, begin to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bowed down to their gods, and Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people, and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one his man who has joined himself to Baal Peor. You see, friends, God said, These people are not going to worship me. They're not going to honor me. So we're going, to, we're going to take off their heads. And we're going to put their heads up and hang them up before the people to let them see that we're not going to tolerate this. Now, friends, understand that God doesn't like people to go against him. He doesn't like people to go against his will. So thereby we must understand that man, God wants your full attention. And I'll keep stressing that. He wants your full time. And thereby, you and I must give that to God if we want to honor Him and praise Him in our lives every day. But here's a problem that we have in life sometimes. Over in the New Testament, it says, evil communications corrupt good morals. Too many times in our lives, we're around and see things that are bad and see things that are wrong. And the more that we are around bad things, the more that we are around evil the more we're going to be influenced to do whatever we're around. You see, friends, you and I today live in a world that's full of sin. And we have a lot of people that don't care how they live and don't care how they act. So let's take a lesson here from Numbers, Numbers where he says, they bowed down and worshiped Baal Peor. They honored this false god. Why? They were mixing and mingling with the people. 
They were doing what those people were doing. We want to be accepted. We want to, we want to have the idea in mind that we want people to like us. The same thing is going on today in our world, in our society. People are bowing down to sin. They're bowing down to false worship and to false gods. Why? Because we want to be accepted. The question is, who do you want to be accepted by? You want to be accepted by man or you want to be accepted by God? Our main ambition in life is to be accepted by God, to do as God directs us to do. So friends, you and I must be very careful that our lives are what God wants it to be and don't be influenced by outside things. Also, we turn over to the book of Judges, chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 5 through 11. Another problem they had back in that time was these children of Israel, they intermarried. They intermarried with people that God says don't have nothing to do with them. They intermarried with these people, friends, that, that were going to draw them away, going to draw their heart away. And we see, this, we see this go on today. We see people sometimes that are strong Christians, devout Christians, that marry somebody that is not a Christian, and then sometimes they are influenced to go to whatever this person is. Is our life strong enough to stand firm our ground? Is our life strong enough that you and I will not be drawn away to sin? You see, friends, we've got to be very careful with what our life is. But let's notice in Judges chapter 3, and let's begin in verse 5. And the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And they took their daughters to be their wives, and gave their daughters to their sons, and served their gods. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and forget the Lord God, and serve Balaam and the groves. Therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the, into the hand of the Chushan-Rishathim, king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served Chushan-Rishathim eight years. And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel, who delivered them unto Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. And the spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel and went out to war. And the Lord delivered Chushan Rezathim, the king of the Mesopotamia, into the hands, and his hand was prevailed against Chushan Rezathim. And the Lord land had rest forty years, and Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. Do any of you recognize the name Othniel? First judge. Okay, I'll ask you how many judges were there? Fifteen judges. Then they won't tell them to me tonight. Othniel? Who's the next one? Ehud. Okay, so we got two of them. We're doing good. But you notice and understand that God always provides people with an opportunity to get right. He provides them with leadership to get them back in line. He provides them with the Bible, the truth that everybody needs, in order that they might know exactly how to walk. But the question is, do people pay attention? Do they listen to what God's saying? Too many times in our lives, people say, well, I know how to direct my own life. I know how to do what I, you know, I do what I want to do. Oh, preacher, we live in a free land. We live in a land where it says, pick the religion of your choice, whatever you want. I want to ask you something. Does God say that? Does God say pick whatever, however you want to worship? I don't find that in his word. I don't find that anywhere. Now, back in the book of Joshua, chapter 24 and verse 15, Joshua said, choose you this day whom you will serve. He said, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And Joshua mentioned some of these same people that we mentioned in the first part of this reading. Those around them that had worshipped idols, those that had worshipped other ways. But Joshua made it very plain. We're going to worship God. I hope that all of us have the same idea have the same thought as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. But you know, idols, idols have been around for a long time. And idols were even in New Testament times. I want us to look over at the book of Acts chapter 17. And I'm going to begin reading in verse 16. 
And I want you to notice the Apostle Paul dealt with the same kind of thing that they dealt back with then. And I want you to notice in this reading that we will have something very unique that Paul says that we all need to pay attention to. Acts chapter 17, beginning in verse 16. Now while Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was stirred in him and he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Can you imagine? The city was what? Wholly given to idolatry. Everybody in that city worshipped idols. They had all kinds of idols. And it says, Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met him with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and the Stoics encountered him and some said, What will this babbler say? Others say he seemed to be a city full of the strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. You know, I kind of I kind of like what they said there and kind of kind of a thought in mind to understand. He's sitting forth a strange God. He's teaching something we don't know. He's teaching something we don't understand. Well, he was he was a strange God to them. Because <laughs> they, they sure didn't know him. Their minds were so mixed up with worshiping idols, they just did, they just didn't care anymore. It didn't make no difference to them. Then he says in verse 19. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears, we would know therefore what these things mean. Now, brothers, understand this, that today sometimes the Word of God is a strange thing to a lot of people. It's a strange thing because they don't know it. They don't study it. And the sad thing is they have never been taught it. Do you know that in our society today, the Bible has been cast aside. There are the, those who now, instead of teaching Bible, teach their own theories, their own ideas, their own thoughts. So let's understand and realize, friends, that we need to pay attention to what we're being taught. We need to pay attention to what we're being given. It said they put him in the air package, and then in verse 20, for thou bring a certain strange things to our ears, we, we would know we're for what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but to either to tell or to hear something new. We want to hear something else. We want to see what you've got to tell. Where, where are you from? Oh, we're from Jerusalem. Where are you from? We're from Corinth. Where are you from? We're from Rome. And all the places that people had come from to here to this place, they wanted to see when everybody came that was new, we want to hear what you've got to say. We want to hear what kind of God you got to worship. It says the Athenians, they spent their time in hearing something new. Well, Paul is going to give them the gospel. But is this gospel new? Is this gospel a new thing? It is to a lot of people. But to those who listen to God and those who serve God, it's not, it's not new. Because, friend, this book, this book is an old book. When's the last time something, something was written, written that's in this book? Anybody know? During the first century? So basically somebody says, this, this book that you have is an old book because it's, it's 2,000 years old. How can you say the New Testament is okay when it's 2,000 years old? We want something new. Well, friends, understand the children of Israel... They obeyed the law of Moses for those that obeyed it. For how many years? How long did the Mosaic age last? Anybody know? 1,500 years? All right, how long, how long did the patriarchal age last? That was before. That's in the time of Abraham. How long did the patriarchal age last? 2,500 years. So thereby for 2,500 years, they had a God to obey and a God to listen to. And they obeyed this God. All right, so the thought in man is then for 1,500 years, the children of Israel had the law of Moses, and they could live with this law, and the law was good because the law was a schoolmaster to bring them where? To Christ. Okay, so now we have, we have this new law, this New Testament, and this New Testament, friends, has lasted these 2,000 years roughly. Understand, friends, that these 2,000 years, this law could last this long. Something's got to be good about it, hasn't it? 
New religions have risen and fallen for centuries. A religion will come up, very soon to be gone. Why? It has no foundation. It doesn't have the backing of God. But the Apostle Paul here, in looking at these people, then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. Anybody in here superstitious? You know, we have our little superstitions in life sometimes, don't we? We have little things that we do sometimes when something happens. But these people here were superstitious in the basis of religion. But then Paul says in verse 23, For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. All right. They said just in case they left one out. They put one out there that says to the unknown God, one that we don't know. Well, Paul said, that's the one I want to declare to you. Now, our thought in mind today is this. Do we, do we know God? Do we, do we understand our Heavenly Father? Do you and I, friends, basically really know who our Father is? You see, friends, it's a very important thing for every person to serve God faithfully. But then let's look over in the, in the Old Testament, the book of Daniel. We're going to look at chapter 3. And we're going to thought it, have the thought in mind that here's a man with the name of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar had an idea that I'm going to build you an idol to worship. And I want you to worship this idol because this idol is going to do something. For, what's the idol going to do for you? How in the world is the idol going to help you? But we look at Daniel chapter 3 beginning in verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He seated up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Now, brothers and sisters, this is, a, this is a huge image. This is a huge idol. How tall would three score cubits be? Anybody have an idea? About 90 feet high? Well, you can see that thing for a long way, I'm sure. But he wanted to make sure that everybody saw it. He wanted to make sure that everybody could worship. Then he says if the breadth was six cubits. How wide is that? About nine feet roughly. So this, this image that Nebuchadnezzar built, he said, I'm going to make you an image that, that'll help you. How's it going to help us? What's it going to do for us? Not going to do nothing for you, if man understands. He said, then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent together together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces, to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together under the dedication of the image which ne that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Understand, friends, that there are people that have been all the way through history and time. There have even been those in our day and time, in time past. There are those who have lived in the 20th century who thought, I'm going to conquer the world and I'm going to allow the world to do whatever I, I want them to do. Where are they? Where's Nebuchadnezzar? Where, where are all these that thought they could conquer the world? Where are they at now? They're gone. A lot of you have studied about Napoleon in history. Napoleon's mission and goal in life was to conquer the known world of his day. And he did, he did the best he could in trying to conquer the known world. But it said that whenever Napoleon came to the end of his life, Jesus Christ thou hast conquered. He signified that he believed in Christ, that he could not conquer him. Mankind has got to wake up and realize that we can't conquer, we can't conquer the world. But we can teach the world. We can lead the world to Christ. All right, it says in verse 4, Then in Herod cried out loud to you at his command, O people, nations, and languages, that at that time you hear the, the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music. You fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. And whoso falls not down and worship it shall the same hour be cast into the midst of the burning fire furnace. Therefore, at that time, when the, all the people heard the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sacrament, the psaltery, 
and all kinds of music, all the people and nations and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. All the people. No, not all of them did. Can you imagine Nebuchadnezzar and the leaders looking out across that crowd? I don't know how many was there. But they saw in the midst of all of this throng of people, they saw three standing up. Who were those three? Thank you. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the idea of man to understand is that these three men would not bow down and worship this image. Why? They believed in God, didn't they? They obeyed God. And friends, today in our lives, we find there are a few that obey God and worship God as God directs. Jesus Christ said there are a few. He said there are going to be a few that will go to heaven. In comparison to the idea of man of the millions and millions that have lived, and the millions and millions that live now, it will more than likely be a few that go to heaven someday. Whenever the flood came, how many souls were saved? Eight. When the children of Israel left the land of Egypt, they sinned in the wilderness, and God said, you will not see the promised land. How many finally reached the promised land of the original that left Egypt? Two. When God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah with a great fire, how many people escaped that destruction? How many? Sodom and Gomorrah, how many escaped? Four left, but only three fully escaped. What happened to the fourth one? Turned into a pillar of salt. God said when you leave this place, don't look back, didn't he? And she just couldn't stand it. She turned around and looked back and turned into a pillar of salt. In Luke chapter 9 and verse 62, Jesus says, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit the kingdom of God. Friends, if you're a Christian, stay a Christian. If you're a child of God, stay faithful to him. Because God does not mince words. God means what he says. So thereby with these ideas in mind, I have no trouble understanding when Jesus says, few will be saved. Brothers and sisters, I want to be one of those few. And I want you to be one of those few. I want you to be dedicated to God. Because these people back in this time weren't very dedicated. We won't look at the story in just a minute if I have time. I won't look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That they got thrown in the fire furnace. I mean, they put coats on them, wrapped them up real good where they'd burn real good. And they took them and threw them in that fire. And it even burned the ones that threw them in there. And whenever they looked in that fire, <clears throat> how many did they see walking around? Four? They only threw three in. They said, there's a fourth one in there, and who'd they say it looked like? Son of God? How'd they know what the Son of God looked like? How did they understand it could have been Him? And when they came out of that fire, there wasn't even a smell of smoke on them. I can get close, I can get close to a, a fire that's burning out here somewhere, and I can stand a little distance away, and when I walk away, I can smell fire on me. Can y'all do that? But they couldn't even smell it. Why? How come that happened? God took care of them. God protected them. And if you serve God faithfully and do what God says, God will take care of you too. But other things that I want to look at is in the book of 2 Kings chapter 17, verses 12 through 20. 2 Kings chapter 17, and we find here a thought in mind that sometimes there are those who hinder the work of God. There are those who get in the way of the work of God being done. There are those who get in the way of those who try to work, work, do the work of God. Friends, we don't ever want to hinder God's plan. We don't ever want to stop it. So thereby, if I don't want to hinder the plan of God, what do I need to be doing? I need to be doing it. I need to be working God's plan every day. But we look at 2 Kings 17, beginning in verse 12. It said, For they served idols whereof the Lord had said unto them, 
Ye shall not do this thing. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers, saying, Turn ye from, from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers, and I will send to you by the servants the prophets. Notwithstanding, they would not hear, but hardened their necks. Like to the neck of their fathers, they did not believe in the Lord their God. Friends, how many times do you hear people say, I don't believe what you say. I don't believe what you believe. And you can take your Bible and you can show them in your Bible exactly what the Bible says. I don't care what your Bible says. I still don't believe it. These people right here, just like those today that don't believe the Word of God, they're walking on dangerous ground. It says in verse 15 of 2 Kings 17, and they rejected his statutes and his covenant that he made with their fathers and his testimonies that he testified against them and they followed vanity and became vain and went unto the heathen that were round about them concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do that like him. What did they do? Where, where are you going? Friends, I want to tell you something. These people here went to those around them and asked them, what do we need to do? Friends, don't you dare ever go to anybody outside the plan of God and ask them for advice. Don't you ever go to anybody that does not teach the truth as the Bible directs and allow them to misdirect direct your heart. This happens a lot of times. We go to the wrong person for advice and we get advice that is no good to us, advice that does not help us, and thereby where do we wind up? We wind up in trouble. In verse 15 it says, And they rejected his statutes and his covenant that he made with their fathers, and his testimonies which is testified against them. And they followed vanity and became vain, and went after the heathen that were round about them concerning whom the Lord had charged. Now I want to read that again because why? Friends, this is a very crucial verse. And I hope you will take this verse, mark it, remember it, because we need to know, we need to know what we need to do in any situation in life. You won't know the truth, you go to God. It says, And they left all the commandments of the Lord their God and made them molten images, even two calves, and made a grove and worshipped all the host of heaven and served Baal. How many times do these people have to be taught a lesson? How many times did they not wake up? It didn't work before, and it's not going to work now. You worship in a vain religion, it's not going to work. It will never work. Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 15, 9, But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrine the what? Commandments of men. They teach things that are contrary to my will. You see, friends, these people here just do not pay attention. Then it says, And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire, and used divination and enchantments, and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord, to provoke him to anger. Therefore the Lord was angry with Israel, and removed them out of his, out of his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah only. And Judah kept not the commandments of the Lord, their God, but walked in the statutes of Israel, which they made. And the Lord rejected all the seed of Israel, and afflicted them, and delivered them into the hand of spoilers, until he had cast them out of his sight. You see, friends, God is a loving God. God is a patient God. And God tries his best to help man. He tries his best to make man stronger. But mankind just simply does not pay attention. But let's quickly, let's move to the New Testament. Let's look at the book of Romans chapter 1. And I'm going to begin reading in verse 25. And I want you to notice in these verses here, and I want you to notice the similarity of what went on with the children of Israel. And I want you to notice what's going on in our day and time today. Friends, this is very plain to me. Those people back then, they lost their lives because they didn't serve God as God directed. There are those in this time that we read about right now that didn't serve God as God directed. Do you think God's going to be any different today? No. Listen to what Paul says. Romans 1, beginning in verse 25. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. 
For this cause God gave them up in vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves the recompense of their reward which was, which was meet. Notice anything? Anything kind of stand out to you? Men with men? Women with women? What's going on in our society today? Same thing. Man does not ever pay attention. Man does not ever learn a lesson. Why do you think Rome fell? Because of these kind of sins. Why do you think nations have fallen in time and history for the same kind of... France fell years ago because of the same thing. People better wake up. And it said, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. You see, friends, what we need to know, God won't make you be a Christian. God won't make you live right. But he'll tell you how. He won't make you do his will. But he'll tell you how. Mankind has got to know, God does not like sin. God does not like sin under any condition. But he says, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, Traviousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things. Uh-oh. Disobedient to parents. Y'all hear anything like this go on today? You hear anything like children don't want to know their parents? They don't want their parents to know them? Friends, the same thing is happening today. He said that without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who know the judgment of God that they which to commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Now, friends, what we want to understand is this. He says they're worthy of death when they do these things. What kind of death? Physical death? The Bible says we're all going to die. Where does the Bible tell us we're all going to die? Where does it say it's appointed to us to die? Hebrews 9, 27. It's appointed to us to die, but after this, the judgment. But when he's talking about dying, you think he's talking about physical death? I don't. I think he's talking about spiritual death. I'm talking about those that die outside God's fold. Those that die outside of what God wants and wants man to live by. Friends, we must pay attention. We must listen. Does anybody have any comments or questions on tonight's lesson? <clears throat> Anything at all? One thing that we must always pay attention to. The Bible warns us. The Bible pleads with us. The Bible begs us. That's why Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, with the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the union of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. These verses must be listened to, must be paid attention to. Anybody have anything they want to say? Anybody got anything they want to ask? <clears throat>